As I mentioned, this is a study in Habakkuk, H-A-B-A-K-K-U-K. One word, three Ks. Who knew? It's not usual. But this very significant minor prophet nestled amongst the thunder of Isaiah and Jeremiah is so very, very powerful. I would remind you that uh, the key to Bible study in its initial discovery is context. That to look at the historical voice of what Habakkuk was saying when he first said it is the key to understanding what we are hearing today as Habakkuk speaks to us today. This book is extraordinary. It is living. We're going to look at the book of Habakkuk tonight. It's as relevant to us now as it was in uh, approximately 630 B.C. when it was first written. And so allow me to take just a couple of minutes to give you a little backdrop as to what is happening, what is the theme, a little bit about the book of Habakkuk, because uh, I thank God uh, for Brother Wendell Gleason, who taught us minor prophets and the richness to be found in them, the very short two or three chapters, three or four pages, but uh, very profound uh, historically and today. Habakkuk is eminently the prophet of the reverential, awe-filled faith. This is the soul and center of his prophecy. One word alone he addresses directly to his people, and that is faith. It is of marvel at their lack of faith. Habakkuk chapter 1, 5, and we'll look at it again. Behold, among the heathen, and gather attentively, and marvel, marvel. That's a, a form of writing in the Jewish culture. When a word is repeated, it's like, 29 exclamation marks. Marvel, marvel, for I am working a work in your days. You will not believe when it is declared unto you. Habakkuk bids them behold and gaze, for God is about to work in their days. He bids them prepare themselves to marvel and marvel on, for it was a matter at which political wisdom would stagger, and they, since they did not have faith, would not believe it. The counterpart to this is that the great blessing of faith, which is the keystone of the whole book, is that it's the core of life. Hebrews 2, excuse me, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, the just shall live by faith. That powerful seven-word phrase is probably the most repeated in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. Prophecy in Habakkuk, full as it is, is almost subordinate. His main subject is the afflictions of the righteous amidst the prosperity of the wicked. Can anybody relate to that? How many times a day do you think the bad guys are winning, the good guys are losing? Well, we're not the first ones to feel that way. The answer is the same. The result of all will be one great reversal. The evil drawing upon themselves evil, God crowning the patient waiting of the righteous and still submission to his holy will The just shall live by his faith represents the key theme in the book of Habakkuk. He is the author. Sometimes a book carries a name and they did not write it. But Habakkuk wrote it. He was a farmer by trade. Habakkuk means to embrace. He embraced God and God's People. He was a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah. Josiah was the king, the boy king. Remember, at eight years old, he, he went to the throne and he found the forgotten law. And under Josiah's leadership, he changed everything. It was time for Israel to get back to righteousness. But the people are stubborn at this point, And God is about to drop the hammer on them to get them to wake up. Okay, you ready? Answering life's toughest questions. Questions fly around us all the time. If you have little people, you're in question mode constantly. Humanity is predisposed to questions. I know I am and have been. 
I submit to you, most struggles of faith are seated in the fact that we have questions that are unanswered. The things that I'm grappling with and that the enemy's beaten me up with have their root in the fact that they're unanswered questions. Now, I grew up in an era, I don't know if they said this, but this is what I heard, this is what I felt, that you can't ask God any questions. You ask God a question, you'll get leprosy of the lips and it'll just go bad from there. You, you, nobody questions God. That is not biblical. Consider the desperate questions of Job. Consider the stubborn questions of Thomas. And in every case, in every example that the Bible gives us, God says, you got questions, I got answers. And bring them. Let's do this. Don't leave the uncertainty or the lack of an answer to be fodder that the enemy uses to cripple your faith, to discourage you, to fracture your relationship with the Lord. God says, bring me your questions. We'll sort this out. Now, let me state the obvious. It's not always the answer you want, and it's never when you want it. Now, here's what is forbidden. You cannot accuse God and that not have impunity. What's the difference between a question and an accusation? Well, a question is about discovery. You know, I don't get it. I need help. I need some answers. An accusation is, well, here's what's happened, and here's what you've done. It's based on a lot of assumptions, previous calculations. People who accuse God, that's not going to go well. People who question God have a chance for their faith to grow in powerful ways. So, we're going to have four questions over the next four weeks. And the question for week one is, where is God when I need him? Where is he when I need him the most? And, you know, it's like when I need him the most, I can't find him. I can't even sense his presence. So we're going to do this in somewhat of an exegetical style where we'll take it kind of a verse at a time. Let's look at Habakkuk 1 and verse 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Oracle here means burden. You know, God has put this on his heart and he's got to share it. Verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. Verse 4, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I don't sense your presence. Those are some pretty tough questions. Habakkuk comes out of the chute and guns are blazing. God, I got a problem here. I'm looking around and it's not pretty. Everything is just falling apart. And really in these, in these opening verses, he submits four different complaints to God that I think all of us have in one way or another offered to God. I would also submit to you that when you, you feel this way, now again, this is the man of God being moved on by the Spirit of God to write. This is not some marginal, show up once a month kind of Christian. This is a man of God. And there are times this man who wants to follow God, I don't get it. I don't get what God's doing. I don't get what God is not doing. You know, like, what is the deal? Basically. So four complaints. Number one, my prayers are going unanswered. That's his first complaint. He says, I, shall I cry for help? It's really a term for wailing. It's very intense. And so Habakkuk is saying, why is this happening to me? And then as part of that, he says, how long? You know, thing, things are getting desperate here. And he's frustrated because apparently this is a, a scenario that he has brought to God before. 
This isn't the first time he and the Lord have talked about it because sometimes you pray about the same thing over and over and over and over again. Do not raise your hands. Look at your neighbor and say, do not raise your hand. But I guarantee you there's people here tonight, you have prayed about the same thing since 2016 began. You've been asking God. Eight months and counting. I'd venture to say there's folks here tonight that for years you have been praying about the same thing. And buddy, that, mm, that gets tough sometimes. Let me say this. God answers prayer in four ways. Now, I knew about three, but let me share with you the fourth that I found out. The first way God answers prayer is, are you talking to me? And, and this, one, this one was a little tough. You know, as a child of God, if there's impurity in my life, if there's unconfessed sin in my life, God's not going to hear me. Okay? So I need to clean it up before I can take it to God. Amen. Then, of course, the one we're very familiar with, God answers prayer by saying, no. Nay, nay. God, will you, God, fix this? God, get me out of this? God, you know, solve this health scenario for me? No. The writer of the majority of the New Testament three times asked God for deliverance from a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was, but it, it just didn't happen, did it? Then, of course, hallelujah, he says yes. Everybody say yes. He does what we ask. Uh, he heals. He provides. He gives us grace. That's wonderful. And then this one, he says, wait. <laughs> Not now. When? He won't say. It's rough. Wait, how long? I, I'm not going to tell you. And then the scripture comes to you, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. <laughs> oh, see, I got a cold. I can't do it. Sorry. Allergies. We'll try next week. But it's just horrifying to realize that you don't get your answers from people you'd like to. You get your answers from God. Now, sometimes he uses people, but answers come from God. And we've got to get to a place where we believe that God's timing is perfect. And that is not a cavalier statement. Because you and I, we have calendars. Uh, there are other people around us that have deadlines. And God doesn't seem to care about either one of them. <laughs> he just doesn't. Because he has no beginning and no end. Let me share a verse with you I found in Isaiah that it's a game changer. Isaiah 5, verse 19. Woe to him who says, let the Lord hurry his work that we may see it. Wow. You know that constant nudging, God, come on, come on. We need an answer. This has gone on long enough. Woe to him who says, let the Lord hurry his work that we may see it. God, help me to get to where I want what God wants, and I want it when God wants it. Everybody say amen. amen. So that's his first complaint, and it's a valid one. It's one I can say, yeah, my prayers are not being answered, God. Complaint number two, my counsel goes unheeded. Look at verse two. You know, God, I'm giving you answers here, and you're just not paying attention. Oh. Oh, I'm laughing because this is just horrible. Oh God, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Hey, I know how to fix this. Would you open your mail? Would you return a call? If you'd listen to me, this could be taken care of in minutes. I know exactly what to do and who to do it to. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we all go, people need to take advice. Do you take advice? <laughs> Only if it agrees with you, you know. And, and we think God needs to take 
and vice. He, he uses this term violence. It's the Hebrew term Hamas. Does that ring a bell? You know, that's what those lunatics have named themselves over there in the Middle East. Violence. It's not a political statement. It's just a, it's a matter of Hebrew. Amen. But it means it's sharp, cutting, it's direct. Habakkuk is seeing this going on, and God's not listening, and God's not doing what he should be doing according to me. Save, deliver from violence. Complaint number three, my circumstances are unbearable. It's just going from bad to worse. I, I'm surrounded by evil. And nothing is happening. Why do you make me witness wrong and not do anything? We live in a very perilous time. Our day is a nightmare. You know, I'd like to just, you know, go out on the prairie and move in with the angles. I don't care if it is a little house. Remember, little house on the prairie, the angles, come on, work with me. Everybody that's seen TV land, come on. Or I wonder if Richie Cunningham has an extra bedroom. I'll move in with the Cunninghams and it'll be happy days. Showing my age here. It's hard to be righteous today. Do you agree? It is hard because evil abounds. But where evil abounds, grace much more about. I've shared this before. It's relevant, though. Um, I got a call, a call from a Bible school asking me if I thought satanic activity, the efforts of evil, had increased. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and then I hung up. No, <laughs> I know I did. Uh, but I, I wanted to encourage him. I said, but, you know, if the devil turns the dial to five, God's going to turn it to ten. Amen. Because he'll never catch God. God will always be better than the world is evil. God will always be stronger than I am weak. God will always be able than I cannot. Come on, somebody. That's the God we serve. Amen. You know, God, you could solve all this, and you're just, you're not doing it. I don't, I don't get it. It's like your word is paralyzed. You're not working on people, and there's some people need some work. I submit to you, Habakkuk felt about his world the way I feel about mine. I, I just, oh, my God. I just don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to read it. It's just so overwhelming, so sad, so tragic, just careening toward tribulation and unbridled wrath of God. So my circumstances are unbearable. My counsel goes unheeded. My prayers are not answered. And then number four, my faith is unraveling. You know, you put all those three things in, man, I feel like I'm losing it. Overwhelmed almost daily. Nothing makes sense, and God doesn't make a difference. I'm not afraid to say those kind of things, because Jesus has heard me say them before. But see, if you'll talk to the Lord, the Lord will talk to you. So I, I don't think you just need to post it. and Give me started on that. Facebook baloney, Lord of heaven and earth. I've never been on it, and I never will. You need your face in a book, not on Facebook. And the church said amen. You see, that wasn't everybody, because some of you are addicted. Jesus wept. What was they saying? I have no idea. I just... I just got on a rant there for a minute, but it surely felt good. Praise God. Because here's the deal. People are nuts. They're nuts. Jesus, Lord and Savior. Help us, protect us. All I know what I'm saying. 
But I, I talked to the Lord. It came back to me. It's kind of like a boomerang. You know, I throw it out there and it comes back because nobody gets it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay. You didn't get that. But I did, and it was, it was a great statement. <laughs> We're back in the saddle again. My Lord, we got Roy Rogers, we got the Cunninghams, the Ingalls. I'm just in flashback mode here. Pardon me, Lassie's waiting in the back seat of my car <laughs> with Rin Tin Tin down at the curb, guarding everybody. Okay. Oh, dear Lord. You know, Nehemiah got really mad. All he's trying to do is rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, for heaven's sake. And just one thing after another. People just causing him all kinds of problems and giving him grief. And Nehemiah went off to God. God said, okay, come on, bring it. Our boy Job, he got a little desperate, didn't he? Here's what you got to know, though. So does God give you the answers? No, not necessarily. Because if he did, you'd feel worse. Because God sees the end from the beginning. If he tells me now, I don't know the end. I'm going to be madder now than I was at the beginning. I think that made sense. So I'm on a need to know basis. You're on a need to know basis. But I can talk to God about it. I really can. So God love Habakkuk. He empties a clip here. You know, he's just... Really laying it out there, God, you're not doing your job. You're not paying attention to me. I have answers and you will take them. Uh, I pray and it doesn't get past my nostrils. It's just very, very frustrating. Now God says, okay, it's my turn. Habakkuk 1.5, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. And then he says this, this is present tense now. I am doing a work in your days. You think I'm not doing anything? You think I have become inactive, that I'm on vacation, that I don't care? I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told to you. What I'm doing right now, when you think I'm doing nothing, is so magnificent, it's so powerful, it's so wonderful. If I told you, you would not believe what I tell you. That's the Bible. Amen. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Uh, their horsemen press proudly on. Their Horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. Verse 9, they come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At the kings they scoff. And at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. For they pile up earth and take it. Then they weep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Little summary here. Chaldea, a regional element of Babylon, probably from the land we know as Kuwait. That's where the Chaldeans were from. Can God take a heathen army and use it for his purposes? Absolutely. The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. In this political debacle, oh, Lord have mercy. Never, never in my worst imaginations can I think of it. I mean, at this point, Andrew Johnson, where are you? <laughs> the worst president that ever lived. You know, I mean, <laughs> some of you got that. Praise God. If you didn't Google Andrew Johnson, he was just horrible. But, buddy, he's looking like a winner today. <laughs> because, like Paul told the Romans, all authority is from God. So the reason I, I, I'm not moving the family to Greenland and just going to raise reindeer or something, you know. <laughs> I've thought about it, I've checked into it, big market, you know. It's because God is in control. And these nuts and this evil 
God will use it for his purpose. He describes these Chaldeans, these horrible elements, bitter, hasty, they march, they kill. They're vicious, they're horrible, aggressive, they slaughter. He, he likens them to leopards, an intense predator, to wolves who hunt in packs at night, to eagles who are the ultimate hunter to see and destroy. He uses the metaphor of sand, crushing, dominance, no earthly respect or hindrance. Those people are my instruments. I'm doing stuff. There is never a moment of time that God is not working on behalf of his people. In Jesus' name, praise God. God's working when I don't see him. And I don't see him a lot of the time. There are many human entities that work when I don't see them, and yet I believe they are. Our, our military around the world, they're working, they're protecting, and I know that. Our police and fire, until there's a siren, you know, I don't, I don't really think about it, but they're on the job. Our, our utilities, I mean, there are entities all around us that, you know, while I don't have visual confirmation that they're doing their job, they're doing their job. Well, why can't I give God the same benefit of the doubt? Amen. Look among the nations, verse 5, and see, wonder and be astounded. You know, just, you know, could you just look around maybe? If you can't see it for yourself, then broaden your view, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. You know, th this is the key to our question, where's God when I need him? I wish we could really have confidence in God. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He's everywhere all the time. Can he be trusted? Yes. Can we be confident in his care? Yes. Can we believe that he knows my situation? Yes. Can we believe that he is able? You know, he uses those two terms, wonder and astounded. If you could really see what he's doing right now, it would be overwhelming. It would be shocking. It would be thrilling. We would be amazed. You'd want to go, dude. Let's all say that on the count of three. One, two, three. Dude. That was pretty good. Like, that's just awesome. He's doing more than I can see, more than I can comprehend, more than I can get my head around. And God love him. My questions, which are so finite and so limited and so, oh, carnal. He just tries to show me the bigger context. You know, that's the way he answered Job. Job was a pretty desperate man. He was a good man. He was a perfect man. According to God, he was a perfect man. And every horrible thing that could happen did and he's going, you know, God, really, this is just horrible. So what does God say? So where were you when I measured the oceans in the palm of my hand? You know, God love you, Job. I know in your world it's really big, but, you know, if you would compare it to me, it's not so big. Amen. He ignores my questions, and, and yet he can give me an assurance that I am able that I am faithful. You say, well, God, I'm just so broken. I'm so dependent. And God says, great. That's where I need you to be. You're not seeing it, but I am on the job. Where's God when I need him? He's doing exactly what I need to be done. I will never see it unless I wait not everybody's going to see it. Not everybody's going to know it because not everybody waits. Only those who wait on the Lord. The scripture is filled with that directive. Be still and know that I am God. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, really, in all of us, four complaints. How about four potential responses as we wrap it up? Sometimes we run. We just give up and we miss what God was doing behind the scenes. And in his timing was going to show it forth.
but we're not there. We bolted. Or we attack. Sometimes we get vicious. We accuse God of failure and apathy. We accuse God of not caring, being callous. Sometimes we despair. You know, I'm toast again. It's just that, that Eeyore mentality, you know. Go ahead. Everybody else does. You know, you're, you're, you're like, who was it that had the cloud over his head and it rained all the time? Was that Eeyore? See, I knew that. I was just testing. But some people, they just, you know, they, they have such faith that things are going to go bad. It's horrible. Or sometimes we fuss. Does anybody hear fuss? Yes, you do. Don't you lie in the house of God. You fuss, you whine, you stew, you grumble. I cannot believe this has happened. Unbelievable. After all I've done for God, I have sat on the pew. I've sat on the pew for months. I have almost paid my tithe. What is happening? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I just can't believe it in light of what a wonderful person I am. And God doesn't appreciate me. You hear me now. Big finish. Nobody has ever been disappointed who waited on God. Nobody. They shall not be ashamed that wait on me. Amen. Doesn't say nobody's ever been nervous. Doesn't say nobody's ever freaked out. But at the end of the day, nobody has ever said, really, is that it? Come on. You go back there and do something else. Come back when you got a bigger miracle. Come back when there's more money involved. You know, no, 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 no. When God steps up and steps out, wow! Unbelievable. Come on, somebody. Because if you don't wait, you're going to miss your miracle. Hear it now. This got preached down my throat today. And I'm going to preach it to you. I was sitting at King's Toyota just going, yes! Ushers, will you come? And nobody came. Anyway. <laughs> We miss our miracle. Don't miss it. It's beyond our hearing. We, we could miss transformation. You know, sometimes the, the delay is because God's trying to fix us first. We are not as great as we think we are. That God is working. Uh, we miss a testimony. We miss a testimony that could impact generations. That you tell what God did for you and how it happened, and it just goes on from generation to generation, and faith to faith. Amen. Everybody wants a testimony, but the root of testimony is test. Not everybody wants a test, but you can't have a testimony without one. We lose the intimacy that the journey of waiting represents. That God, whatever you do, and whatever you do it, I'm okay with that. It's not an easy road, but it's really, I look at my options. I'm trusting God as the only one with any real possibilities. I'll never wait without faith, believing the word of God and acting upon that. I affirm again tonight that God can be trusted, that he is worthy of your highest confidence. You will have a testimony, and that's how we overcome. Amen. And when I thought it was over, Jesus came through. Amen. Man, you tell that to the coming generations, it's powerful. And again, I remind us we're on a need-to-know basis. And when God has told me a little bit, I've said, oh, okay, I, I don't want to know anymore. Because I, ooh. I'm really confused now, you know, because it's always been and it always will be that his ways are above our ways. That's just the deal. That's not a panacea. That's not just a, a bailout or whatever. That, that's the truth. 
And so God help us to embrace it and to live it. Where's God when I need him most? He's doing his best. He's doing his best. I told someone yesterday, maybe, maybe the best strategy right now is just tie another knot in a rope and hold on with both hands. Norman Walkwell, one of his favorite paintings to me, remember the, the little uh, store that's on a cliff and the horse has gone over the cliff. It's hanging by its bridle. And then the guy is hanging on by the horse's tail with both hands. Well, I feel that way sometimes. Not only physically, but that's the view I have of the world. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just... I went to the doctor today and something happened. I, I don't know. Started a new medication and I, one edit button I did have has gone. Left it in the parking lot. And of all the things I've said over the last 40 minutes, that's what you'll remember. Whatever it takes to impact your life. I love you. Hang on. Hang on, God's faithful. Hang on, God's working in magnificent ways. You know, we're praying about Temple Baptist. We're fasting. We're, we're going to God. It's going to happen. Hey, hey, hey. What? Legal wranglings. Now we're just on hold. What's that mean? God said, you know, hey, I'll be back in a minute. Let, you know, just hold that thought. God is working for us. God is working for us in spectacular ways. Everything is a resource to God. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? Let's thank the Lord by faith tonight. If you've been praying about the same thing for a long time, if you, if you feel like Habakkuk, man, I, I can't take it. My faith is unraveling. My prayers are unanswered. You won't listen to me, God, and I've got great ideas. Let's just... Say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to trust you. Jesus, I thank you for these precious people. I thank you, Lord, for our lives that we can put into your hands. And, Lord, I'm going to take you at your word that you are doing a work so wonderful and yet unseen, so powerful and yet unmeasured, so magnificent and yet unknown beyond what I would even believe. If you told me what you were doing, I wouldn't believe it. So Lord, give us peace, give us confidence in your sure hand, in your provision, in your power. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Take the hand of the person next to you and want you to pray for them. You don't know where they are, the journey they're on. Would you pray encouragement to them? Would you pray confidence and peace to them? Would you pray, Lord, help us, God, to take our questions to you, Jesus, to open our hearts, to bear our souls, Lord. Don't let the enemy lock us up and make us bitter in Jesus' name. Pray for my brothers and sisters tonight, wherever they are in life, in a circumstance. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. Lift your voice in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. <laughs> praise God, praise God. Let's thank the Lord. He's working a work. You're working a work, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of our God. Greet one another in Jesus' name.